Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for coming in such a wonderful number. And uh, let me tell you what our great teacher Zen Master Sum San constructed as the backbone of our teaching. The backbone of Zen teaching ever since the sixth patriarch uh, appeared and got transmission is Kongans. Before the sixth patriarch, Henning Sunim or Hui Neng, we did not have such instruments and uh, we were really missing them. So how did Kongans appear? Kongans appeared out of a very tough situation. As you all know, Henning Sunim or Hui Neng got secret transmission from the fifth patriarch. And because of that, he was pursued by a very strong and very ambitious monk. And as this pursuer caught up with him, Henning Sunim hid behind a big rock, but first put the relics of the Buddha, the kasa and the bowl, onto a rock. And as legend has it, the strong monk came and tried to grab these two. Because by possessing these two, he could declare himself sixth patriarch. But these two objects just would not move. And then this monk got very frightened and said, Younger brother, please, I mean you no harm. Come out, I would like to speak with you. So Henning Sunim eventually came out and uh, this very strong monk pleaded with him. I did not come here for the robe and the bowl, I came here for the Dharma. And then Henning Sunim asked him, when you don't think of good and bad, what is your true face? Then the strong monk had a big awakening experience. That's the origin of our Kongan practice. So when you don't think of good and bad, what is your true face? That was the first Huadu. In short, what is your true face? Even shorter, what are you? Even shorter, what is this? Okay? So, the Kwadu is our basic and most fundamental question in our Son Bulyo and the birthplace of Kanwa Son, the birthplace of stopping the mind and perceiving. This is used in many ways. But the basic Kwadu of Immoko, or what am I, don't know, is used best to sharpen your intuition and perceive your correct situation, correct relationship, and correct function, always, everywhere. And how do you test this? Then come the Kongans. The Kongans are situations that are really paradoxical, which human logical thinking cannot successfully solve. You can explain them, you can comment on them, you can judge them, but you cannot satisfactorily solve them, if you think. That's why the teaching says, if you want to pass through this gate, do not give rise to thinking. And here we have to put a little stop to our discussion or discourse on Kongans. Many people in the West believe that uh, this is so strange, so much out of the ordinary, uh, that it has almost no relation to the scriptural, written or established forms of Buddhism. And this is not true. We should imagine our own Buddhist culture, we started 2,557 years ago, uh, in a very, very neat and clear hierarchy. And it started with the teaching of the Buddha, and then it goes on with the teaching of the patriarchs, many, many people. And it builds up on the three you know, treasures, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. It builds up to the three baskets of Sutra, Abhidhamma, and Vinaya. And we have all these teachings in a correct hierarchy. And on top of it, there's something that the mind cannot comprehend by thinking. It can be a Kongan, it can be any other question, 
It can be any kind of intellectual task. But that task only seems intellectual. Your intellect is given that so that you would experience your own limitations. Even the origin of Kongan is somehow, I would say, historical, if not mystical. It comes from the Chinese Kung An, which means public case. And uh, as you still have it in your Korean administrative procedure, if there's an original and there's a copy, it's validated by a common stamp. It's put over the edge, the joining point of the two documents, half of being on the original, half on the copy. And they use this seal to verify the authenticity of a copy. So how does that relate to our practice? If your mind and the teacher's mind fit in the same way that the two give one, that the two are completely connected, it's just like the question and answer of the Kongan itself. So, if you start Kongan practice and uh, you practice with a teacher, then soon your minds are tuned together. In fact, that's what your practice is about. So as to experience the mind-to-mind -mind connection between first two human beings and then many more. And Kongans help you do that, but there's no guarantee that you'll actually get what you want precisely because you want it. So as long as you keep wanting that, it will never happen to you. But if you don't put energy into that, it also doesn't happen to you. So what can you do? That's when the element of great faith comes. First, we had a great question, what am I? That's the what we are working with, or what is this? then you already see that the limitations of the intellect, conceptual thinking, will impose serious barriers. But there were people before you who could go beyond that. So you have something we call initial trust. And by experiencing more and more uh, the states of meditation, you develop what we call great faith. This faith is important because if you don't have it, you cannot go through your own crises. You cannot solve your life kungans. And then, in the meantime, the third important element comes, we call that great courage. Because you have to be courageous, just like the Buddha was, to discard all the illusions of self and the world. You and other. So, having wrapped this up, you already understand why in the West there are many misunderstandings about the Kongans, because they treat it as a very special uh, little box of Buddhism, and not something which is inherently connected to the hierarchy of the previous teaching. Throughout the 2500 year history of the Buddha's teaching, there were many renewals. Even the separation of Theravada and Mahayana should be considered as such. Because Mahayana had to appear. If it doesn't appear, then the old ways would stop being adaptive. They would stop being flexible. They couldn't take new cultural forms. They couldn't enter new territories. And because of that, the teaching would remain limited. A thousand years after Buddha came Bodhidharma, or Dharma Desa. And his approach is actually the birthplace of Zen. But he didn't develop the Kongans themselves. Instead, we owe him uh, a great tribute for what he did with uh, the four principles of Zen, which is do not depend on the scriptures directly pointing to human mind, attaining enlightenment by experiencing our true self, and transmission outside ceremonies and scriptures, so mind-to-mind -mind transmission. These four principles actually are the four pillars without which you cannot speak of Zen practice. But again, what the West fails to understand many times, that after a thousand years of practicing the sutras, the precepts, uh, the various meditation practices, came Bodhidharma, not right away. So when we practice our precious teaching, we do have to follow what's in the three baskets. We do have to take refuge in the three precious gems. We do have a job of eventually getting to know what the sutras, you know, sh you know and the shila and the, the abhidhamma say. 
So one doesn't exist without the other. The West has sometimes this very dualistic approach that this is unnecessary, this is superfluous, this is too old, this has already been used and therefore we can discard it, a typical consumer view. But this one is new and fresh and essential, I want this with a warranty. It doesn't work like that. So Bodhidharma saw that the only way to make a very clear statement is not by speech, but maybe sitting nine years in Sorimsa, and he did that. And he didn't give a transmission which would be just a piece of you know, scripture, which uh, Hui Ko got you know, later. But he made sure that the mind seal of the Buddha is actually carried forth. He had only five disciples. Therefore, you can see that the approach that these great teachers have taken is extremely quality oriented. And now we get back to our Kongan practice, which is about mind quality. It improves the quality of your mind because you don't get stuck with your conceptual thinking. You are pursued, you are encouraged, you are somehow poised to go further. What pursues you is your own desire to get enlightenment. What haunts you is your inability to do so while you are thinking. And that's why Kongans were developed. That's why the students' and the teachers' minds have to match. That's why questions and answers have to match. And when you intuitively feel, as well as verified by the teacher, that the answer is correct, then something becomes complete. And some, there's something that you can use to straighten out your karma. There's something you can use to attain liberation and help others attain the same. In the Chogya order, based on the old Chinese tradition, we have 1,700 kongans. Most of them are from the Inje school, or the Linchi school, because after the Sixth Patriarch, five big schools appeared. And some of them uh, handed down kongans, like Inje Sansanim's you know, school, Master Linchi's, but uh, some of them did not, and some of them just disappeared. The uh, Soto or Jo Dong Jong, they also have what we call the Book of Serenity, but they don't use Kongans in the same way as the Lin Chi line or the Imje line. The Imje line was very interesting because uh, they, that's where they developed the Dharma combat or Sun Moon Tap in Korean. And the Sun Moon Tap is actually a test how well you can use your non-dualistic wisdom. You fall into duality, you're killed right away. Just like a real martial artist, if he or she thinks of defeat or victory, that's already defeat. So if you start thinking, you lose it. If you cannot function, you also lose it. So how can you find your way in this jungle of 1700 Kongans? or just 365 kongans, or maybe just a few dozen kongans, or maybe just the 10 gates, okay? Uh, I owe deep gratitude to Sung San Sunim for a lot of reasons. But one of them, which is very relevant here, is not just his Dharma inspiration and exemplary life as a Zen monk and teacher, but also that he put a system into existence. And the system is called the four kinds of like this. It's a basic approach. Like this comes from the Buddha's time. Its synonym is suchness or thusness or in Sanskrit tathata. In other words, if you look at the world, first we think of it as good or bad, right or wrong, pleasing or suffering. But if you remove your conceptual projections, then a person is not good or bad, but maybe upset, maybe happy. This wall is neither good nor bad, but it's gray. This floor is neither big or small, but it's brown. So once we start to see more clearly, then we see our own projections. Then we see how we create our world by our thinking and feelings and being attached to them being identified with them. 
And that's exactly the layer of illusion that we are stuck in. That's exactly what we need to remove to solve not just the Kongan, but our lives and deaths. So this suchness or thusness has four kinds in Sumsan Sunim's teaching. One is what we call without like this, without thusness. Those entities who have or that have no mind or no reflective capability, they don't have the question of what am I? They don't have the notion of life and death. So that's like rocks and trees, some animals, maybe some other beings that we are not aware of. But for them, there is no question of why am I born. For them, there is no notion that I am born, I am alive, and I will die. So we call that without thusness. They cannot wake up because they don't have a notion of samsara. They don't have a notion of illusion. So if you have no awareness of an illusion, you also cannot get rid of it. You also cannot wake up. Okay? Then comes... The second, we call that become one like this. So become one like this is our, our substance, our true self, the experience of oneness or no thinking. In the old days, the Zen master just shouted, HA! Or Dong San Zen master just raised his stick and hit the table. That moment of no thinking is the experience of your substance. It doesn't matter that you start thinking right after that. But at least for one precious moment, there was no thinking. There was no I. There was no self. There was no ego. Zero. So we call that become one like this. Because your mind becomes one. The 10,000 thoughts disappear and the cluttered state of your mind just becomes one. And that oneness is something that we can easily attain compared to how difficult it is to keep it. And that's why we need to practice. You don't practice, you can't keep it. Because you, the entropy of your mind, the divisive habits of your mind, the sensory attachments of your mind break up again into concepts and thoughts and uh, feelings and illusions and you're trapped. So become one like this is the actual experience of awakening and it's not difficult to get there. You practice hard for some time, you can. But it's very difficult to keep it. And that's why this practice continues with what we call the truth. And this truth is only like this. So when you attain substance, then your mind becomes clear like space, clear like a mirror. Then it starts to reflect. Then you see, the wall is gray, the floor is brown, the lights are incandescent, there are people sitting in the room, there's a faint hum of the traffic outside. So with the third kind of like this, the truth, you get clear eyes, clear ears, clear smell, etc, etc. And uh, if we miss the truth, then we cannot exist in this world. But do we see clearly? Do we hear clearly? Do we taste, smell, touch and think clearly? And if you look very closely, you realize that many times we mix our thoughts with our feelings. Many times we try to smell something, but immediately your thinking takes over. Or your emotions. So it's like, it's like a very, very big bunch of noise. Where is the signal? Where is the truth? And just one moment you lose the truth and your emotional reaction takes over. You can't help somebody who is bleeding. You can't resolve an accident. You can't help your spouse in distress because your cognitive reaction takes over. So truth is essential. Just as essential as your substance. But your substance has no name, no form, no life, no death, no appearance, no disappearance. If you're attached to that, you're trapped. You're trapped. So next comes truth. It's like still images, still very clear perceptions. 
This that your eyes see, your ears hear, your mouth and tongue taste, your nose smells, etc., etc. So, are we clear about that? And it seems very basic. It's like kindergarten. But can we do it? Are we absolutely clear about that moment to moment? What we think, what we feel, all the physical you no know, sensations? And if you look into that, you see how much noise we have, how we are crosswired by our habits, you know? You know? And based on this truth, we can do correct function or action. And there are two kinds of function. One is what we call the inner point, the subject just like this. Subject is you, it's ourselves. And just like this is experiencing a quality which is really, really overflowing our whole being. So, as we'll see soon in the Kongans, uh, you 100% become tiger, or 100% become dragon. So when you're hungry, then you just want to eat. I'm very hungry. When you are thirsty, you just want water, so you drink water. When you are tired, you sleep. When you have energy, you work or you help other people. So this kind of approach is you know, something inside and you become one with that. And that kind of oneness is called subject just like this. Okay? And its corresponding figure is the object just like this. So when somebody is hungry, you give that person food. When somebody is thirsty, you give that person a drink. So if you put these four kinds of like this in order, there's a sequence. The first one we already cleared, it's without like this. Then we have our dualistic consciousness that has to become one. We attain our substance. We call that become one like this. Next step is seeing clearly, hearing clearly, is the truth or only like this. And then comes our function, which is just like this. Subject just like this, I become that, 100%. And object just like this, relating to somebody's state of mind, state of being. Now, you have heard the theory. Let's get down to business. Here's Mangong Sunim's Kongans, and I would like you to look at it. The first is substance. So everything has already become Buddha. During the Dharma speech delivered from the high rostrum, Zen Master Mangong had the following exchange with the student. One sutra says, everything has already become Buddha. Does anyone understand what this means? Jin Song Sunim answered, dirty water, two buckets. Mangong Sunim shouted, how do you take care of dirty water? Jin Song shouted, ha! Mangong Sunim hit Jin Song on the head with his Zen stick. Jin Song bowed to Mangong and left. Then Mangong said, the correct Zen Dharma eyes are not reckless. All right. So, you look at the opening. Everything has already become Buddha. Does anyone understand what this means? So Jin Song Sunim, he has, he has courage, he reflects. There's something like two buckets of water in the room that had to be. So he reflects that. He uses his eyes to reflect the truth. But Mangong Sunim immediately jumps to function and asks him, how do you take care of that water? It's not enough to see it. If it's dirty, you have to do something with it. And then Jin Song Sunim, instead of going to function and doing something, he shouts. He goes back to substance. That's a mistake. And that's why Mangong Sunim hits him on the head with his stick and of course, then Jin Song Sunim understood his mistake. He bowed and left. Still not, not correct, but at least he didn't make it worse. And then Mangong Sunim cleared it out and says, Correct Zen Dharma eyes are not reckless. That means if you have courage, you have to have wisdom too. If you have energy, you have to have intuition too. Okay? Because if not, then your first move may be correct, but the second and the third, they are not. Okay? Next is truth. It's one of my favorite kongans from Mangong Sunim. He was a great, great Zen master. 
Ka, just two, three weeks ago, we had a ceremony at Sudoksa to its commemoration. And uh, I was very happy to take part. So candlelight. One evening, Zen Master Mangong lit a candle by the window in his room. Then he asked his attendant, which is the true light? The candlelight or the light reflected in the window? The attendant blew out the candle and said, Master, what can you do? Then Mangong Sunim relit the candle. So, what would most people say to the first question? Which is the true light? Of course, they say, it's the candle. They would say that. Because, of course, the reflection comes second, the candlelight comes first, but what was before the candlelight? So, of course, the attendant is smart, but smart only. He blows out the candle. That means he's attached to the candle. If you're attached to the candle, mistake. Attached to the reflection, also mistake. Either way you go, not correct. So what is the truth here that doesn't depend on candle or reflection? So if you see the four kinds of light, this, you see how this starts to work. But as I see in most of your eyes, it's a little bit like groping in the dark. It's like trying to figure out something which you're really not familiar with. And you know what? It's completely correct. This kind of unfamiliarity is correct. Because most of your time as a sincere Buddhist, you don't practice with this, which I wish you would. In Korea, there are wonderful places to do this. In Europe and America, there are also wonderful places to do this. If you seek, you find. Why? What you have learned so far is far from useless. It's very important and very useful. But this is one more step. One more big step for which patriarchs, monks and nuns, lay Buddhists have been striving endlessly. There's hundreds of millions of hours of effort in this. There's hundreds of years of uh, work in this. There is hundreds of millions of people actually doing this over the last 2,500 years. And that's how this kind of distilled essence of common practice could come to us. Now comes the fun part. Subject just like this, function. Mangong Sunim returned to Jonghesa from Odesan, and upon his arrival, Pyok Sunim asked him, Master, at Odesan Stillness Palace, there is a dragon. Did you see the dragon's nostrils or not? Yes, I saw them. How big are they? And Mangong Sunim now, this kind of sound, like a dragon. So, for Pyok Sunim's sake, Mangong Sunim became dragon. Not right away. He gave a little space for Pyok Sunim to spar with him. Because when he says, yes, I saw them, it's already a little explanation. It's already back to thinking a little bit. He could have given a much stronger answer, but Pyok Chosunim was actually his friend. And uh, of course, Pyok Chosunim holds his stand and he says, how big are they? And then for Mangong Sunim, easy. Then he finishes it very clearly with becoming the dragon. So if you look at other cases, other congruence, the object, just like this, the counterpart, it's between an attendant and Mangong Sunim. And he asks him, uh, every day I don't do anything. Why do you bring me tea? Then the attendant says, have another cup, please. Now that's brilliant. Okay? So Mangong Sunim gives him the bait. Do you want to think about cause and effect? Do you want to make something in your mind? And if the attendant started to exploit, you know, Mangong Sunim's great image, oh, I bring you tea because you're such a great Zen master. That's a very low-class answer. <clears throat> then the Zen master scolds him. Don't attach to thinking. Don't attach to Zen master. Don't attach to illusion. Things like that. But the attendant was extremely intuitive and very perceptive and just ignored all the possibilities and the dangers of conceptual thought. Just have another cup, please. Perfect. And uh, 
Of course, the fifth is out of the ordinary. Just like I uh, said, the system has four parts, the four kinds of like this. And of course, it's not complete. If it was complete, it would be seeming perfect, and that would be a mistake to think that it's perfect. It never is, but it gives you enough. Okay. So, when you look at this, Haynes has sent him a letter. In the ten directions, there are numberless temples uh, that are made in the complete stillness jewel palace. We are not clear about this. Where is this jewel palace? And Mangong Sunim wrote a poem which ends like this. This palace is built in my nostril. Now this sounds really irreverent a little bit. There are many scriptures that talk about nirvana, or the sublime state of samadhi, or the four jhanas. And remember, the jhana is the origin of Zen. Jhana, channa, chan, son, Zen. It's the same thing, okay? But, if you make something in your mind, you lose that original palace. You lose that original mind. You lose your original light, all right? So that's why Manam Simr is in his nostril. When he breathes in and out without thinking, then there is no thought. There is no thought. And uh, of course, they wrote back to Mangong Sunim, challenging him again. They are attached to his speech, or they seem to be attached to his speech. He says, well, you say it's in your nostril, so why don't you guide us there into this palace? So they, they, they want to catch him. And he says, what are you talking about? That temple is already in Kayasan. So he perceived that people from Hainsa wanted a form. But then there is already a form temple. That is Hainsa. So what is it that exactly that you are looking for? So you see how the intuition of the mind is clearly at play between substance and truth, making something and taking away something. So Sansa used to say many times, don't make anything. Sometimes really harsh, but full of love and compassion and help. Why did he do that? Because the questioner's mind was just full of illusions, full of name and form. And the person was attached to these names and forms. So once you are entering the realm of the Kongans, you cannot use these illusions. You can use your words when it's necessary. You can use your actions. You can use the, your whole being. But without the dualistic existence that you are in, without the dualistic mind, without the illusions that you are identifying with. So it's a very interesting thing. Like I said earlier, you cannot think if you want to solve this, but you have to function. So you function without thinking. We call that just do it. So when you see, just see. When you think, just think. When you smell, just smell. When you taste, just taste. But if you mix all these with your thinking, if you cut it up with your dualistic categories, if you mix it with your emotions, you are in the jungle of wrong views, anger, and desire. Okay? So it's a really precise tool, a fantastic means to practice and keep your clear mind. And, of course, the other konga, which is truly out of the ordinary, is what we call the attack konga. It's not there, don't look for it. <laughs> we didn't write it down. You have to listen. <laughs> and this is really interesting. So, uh, just as to go back to Tang Nara, Tang Dynasty, they asked uh, Joju Sonsa many times, what is Buddha? And especially on Buddha's birthday, they had a lot of, you know, reverent talks and uh, inquiries, etc. And he said one day, if I met the Buddha when he was born, I would have killed him, cut his flesh up to pieces, fed him to a hungry dog, and then there would be peace. Now, if you were the questioner, and Joju Sunim answers you like this, how would you have responded? you would feel offended, right? You asked a very sincere question about the Buddha and then he answers like that. Now, that offense is mixing your emotions with reality. 
You can't reflect because you're upset. Many times our relationships with other human beings, they completely break because we can't take our own emotions out of it. We can't take our own thinking out of it. We can't take our judgments out of it. And because of that, we suffer and make others suffer. So, attack is not attacking someone else. Attack is when your own karma attacks you. So, getting back to Mangong Sunim, uh, he, he asked once, if you can bring me the sand of a cicada, then this watermelon is free. If not, you have to pay for it. So, they, they were at Podoksa, all the monks were there, it was summer, and you know the cicadas and it's chick, 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 very harsh, very light. It's like two pieces of metal. I can't understand how these little insects are capable of that. It's like over 100 decibels. It's, it's terrible. And when you have a, a bunch of them, and you sit in a sompang, in a, in a zen room, you really have a hard time not to react to them. It's, Shut up! You know, because it's really loud. So, he said, if you can bring me the sound of a cicada, watermelon is free. If not, you have to pay for it. So that attacks the monk's situation, because monks normally don't have any money, especially not for food. They are offered food. And uh, many monks tried many things. So they tried the four kinds of like this, or maybe the three kinds of like this. So becoming like a cicada, copying the cicada. They say, in form there is no sound, in sound there is no form. So that's like a theoretical approach. Many things, but Mango said, no, 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 you have to pay for it. No, you have to pay for it. No, you have to pay. No, you have to pay. So then uh, uh, the world Sunim answered, and of course you have to find out what the answer is. And uh, then Mango Singh was very happy. Why is this in such instances that somebody answered and the Zen master smiled? Why is that in the Konga itself? Because that makes you absolutely sure that there is an answer. Sometimes the Kongans are so bad that you believe there's no answer. But there is. Always. But no one knows whether it's motion or stillness, speech or silence, movement or not movement. You don't know that. So uh, this don't know is our treasure. You get to this don't know by really, really seeing that your thinking is just like a net. And this net can capture a lot of fish, but it can never capture the sea. So if you want to become one with the universe, you can use many things, but your thinking can only give you some conceptual wisdom, some rational thought, some kind of system, and lots of conclusions and challenges. Your thinking is not a bad animal. Your thinking is just what it is. But if you don't understand its limitations, you cannot go beyond that. So your thinking can catch a lot of precious fish from the sea, but it can never catch the sea itself. For that you have to put down the net, get out of your boat of yourself and take a swim and become the sea. And once you've done that, you have to come out a little bit, become human again, and then do your job as a human being who took a swim in the sea. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I finished the introductory with one Kongan. I'm not, I'm not going to even tell you whether it's uh, an attack Kongan or a subject or object just like this Kongan or anything of that kind. I just give it to you and you do with it whatever you want. It's one of the most magnificent Kongans Mangong Sinim ever produced. Everybody in this room knows that there is uh, a special retreat. 90 days, coming from the Buddha's time. First they had it only in the summer you know, season, when there was monsoon in India and monks couldn't travel. In uh, Chinese Korean they call it the Ango. So Hango is the summer retreat and Dongango is the winter retreat. This winter retreat appeared in uh, Pai Chang Sunim's time in China, because Buddhism became very popular and well supported in the Tang Dynasty. And actually, they had to give more opportunity and also an obligation to monks to practice. So the winter culture, the Dongango, appeared. And ever since then, ever since the Tang Dynasty and uh, the time that Buddhism came to Korea, we operate with these 90-day retreats that wintertime, three months, summertime, three months. And in between this 
uh, other three plus three months are called heije, the loose or the traveling period. The kyoji is the tight period. When everybody's together, Son Park Sunim sit in the Zen hall, only together action, together practice, some of them sleep in Jidebang, some of them in the Sonbang. Uh, it's a very, very uh, fantastic life. So after this uh, Kyoche, or Ango, Mangong Sunim sat on the high rostrum and he said, all of you have been practicing very hard for three months. As for me, I just sat in my room making a net. This net is very special. It captures all Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, sentient beings, everybody in the six realms of existence and the four realms of heaven. How do you get out of this net? <clears throat> so monks, they made many kinds of answers. They were fresh with practice energy. Okay? But nobody could answer correctly. So this is top of the line, you know? And if you really want to answer this, just return to Donna. Return to this clear, unmoving, not thinking mind. And then when, when your mind mirror starts to function, when your mind space become clear, then some reflection appears. Then some answer appears. And you can enter the gate of Zen, which as I said, is completely without thinking, but with complete function of yourself. So ladies and gentlemen, that was the introductory, and I would like to welcome any questions of yours. Okay. You, you mentioned a, uh, a tax zen, a, 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 an attack cone. Attack cone, yeah. Yeah, yeah. What, what, what is that? Uh, is, is, and you said that my, if, um, it's my own karma that's attacking me. But of course, when it's an attack kongan, then the Zen master attacks you, or you can attack the Zen master. So, uh, it's a very simple thing when somebody says, uh, why do you have six fingers? That's an attack on one. They want to throw an illusion at you. How would you answer? Why do I have six fingers? Yeah, somebody says, why do you have six fingers? Oh, I do have six fingers. No, be because uh, um, the good Lord gave me six fingers. <laughs> <laughs> Six fingers and six only. That's the point. So, if uh, somebody says you have six fingers, is that correct or not? That's that's uh, correct in a, no, in a sense. No it's, yeah. no, it's not correct. Well, I have I have nine, nine fingers and two th eight fingers and two thumbs. Yes. Oh yeah, you're very correct with your English. You know. <laughs> In other languages, you don't distinguish so much between the thumbs and the fingers. You call them pretty much the same. Okay. But uh, that's when people attack you with some falsehood. Okay. Or uh, there is a, another one. That's, so Mang, Mangong Sunim receives Hebong Sunim and uh, one of them says, Somebody likes to kill. Who is the best killer? Then the other one says, today I see him here. Then uh, Hei Bong Sunim says, I want to cut your neck. Do you give me permission? Then Mangong Sunim responds, I'm not going to say what. And then Hei Bong Sunim was very happy. So that's an attack on that. Multiple. It's like when two great tennis players have a lot of you know, exchanges. Mm -hmm. And if you are attached to uh, your reactions, then you cannot solve it in a non-dualistic and satisfactory manner because your karma attacks you. Your own reactive mind attacks you. All right? Good. More questions? Uh, no, sir. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Monster, would you further elaborate on the notion or wisdom of don't know? by introducing us more examples. Uh, don't know has no thinking. So it has no wisdom either. 
just like empty space has no objects, but it gives an opportunity for these objects to exist and to appear. So don't know, which has no words, no speech, no past, no present, no future, no life, no death. Everything that you chanted in the Heart Sutra is just no, 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 no. That's don't know. But if you say don't know, if you think don't know, it's not true don't know. Because it doesn't have any words or speech, only maybe this. So that's the space, that's your mind space where your clear wisdom can appear, where your clear perception can appear. And uh, all the examples are about this. So there is no special example. But what I really encourage everybody to do, when you have a very tough situation, when you see that you are so limited in your capabilities to solve a problem, to solve a crisis, then stop and look. This stop and look is in every tradition where there is some mind practice, meditation practice, not just in Buddhism, in many other parts of the world. But Kanva Son, stopping and looking, perceiving Kanva, you know, perceiving the phenomenon, or Shamatha Vipassana, stopping and looking. In Tibetan there is another, you know, two names corresponding to this, is exactly what's necessary. Because returning to Tono means your mind doesn't move. The waves of your karma subside. So it's like a pond which returns to complete stillness, at least for a moment, so that you could reflect the sky above you, the clouds above you, the trees overhanging the water. So stop and look. Become clear and reflect. That's how this wisdom can appear. It's everywhere. It's everywhere and people are trying desperate means to stop their own minds and desperation is not the best in all guidance. And if, try, if they try the wrong method, then the medicine becomes the sickness. And it happens many times. So doing this, stopping and looking in the right way, the correct way, is essential. And that's when spiritual traditions come out really, really important. The Buddha said, do not believe what I say because it is spoken by an established and recognized person. Do not believe that because it's logical. Don't believe that because it's handed down by the elders. Don't believe that because other people believe it. If you find that it's trustworthy, try it, test it, live up to it. And if it doesn't work for you, throw it away. These precious words were among those that brought me to the Dharma. Of course, more was necessary, but if this kind of safeguard is not built in, I'm not here wearing these robes, because I don't believe in it then. Why am I saying this? Because this wisdom is not something that's written somewhere. You can get good thoughts, you can get uh, initial guidance, you can get some conclusions from the scriptures. But if you don't have your clear mind digesting all this, your intuition, cleaning it up, then this innate wisdom doesn't function and it doesn't appear. And that would be a serious limitation. A limitation we should not and most likely cannot live with. So this don't know is essential. Your mind really stops, at least for a moment it stops. Then you perceive and that perception, when inside and outside again become clear, that's the source of your wisdom and compassion and strength. These three, like a tripod, are essential for your own being, not just for your practice, but for your own being as a human. If you don't have wisdom, compassion and selfless power, innate strength, you cannot put any meaning into your life and death. So something is necessary to transcend the world that we were born into. Correct way. Correct practice. If it doesn't appear, 
we become this seemingly intelligent channel of inputs and outputs. Physical inputs and outputs, food and everything else at the other end. Sensory inputs and outputs. Lots of thoughts in and out, but what did we get? In Europe we say the shroud has no pocket. In Asia you say coming empty-handed, going empty-handed, that is human. What is it that you take with you? Do you have a clear direction or your karma pushes you to your next incarnation to start just where you left it off? So don't know and this wisdom, compassion and selfless power, it goes a long way. We can't just wet our lips with it. But if you start practicing, you see how deep that goes. All right? More questions? So I practice the Kung a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then I, it's a kind, a kind of a conceptual for myself. Mm -hmm. And I felt that there are two practice with the Kung an to reach, uh, uh, to reach to the, the don't know mind. To practice? No, in oh. order to practice. In order to practice, on, yes. I thought I cannot find the uh, solution or answer mm -hmm. result. Mm -hmm. instead, instead of having the result to answer, mm -hmm. to reach mm -hmm. to the don't know mind. Is that well, right? Uh, uh I think your, your approach is a little bit complicated. Because when you practice the Huadu, what am I or what is this? That's when you experience don't know. What am I? Don't know. Then just breathe out. So then you experience don't know, and that's wonderful. But when you solve a Kongan, then you get an answer. Like Magong Sunin became the dragon, or he becomes the tiger in another Kongan. So by solving the Kongan, you use don't know. You already use it. And besides the Kongan answer, you don't get anything special. But you get one thing. Your functioning don't know, which we call intuition. So don't know is our substance, but when it starts to work, it intuitively produces things and also absorbs things. So don't check your mind. Don't want to know how to use don't know, because you can't. The understanding that you get today, no matter how deep that goes, is so little. Just like the net is very small and insignificant compared to the sea. Okay? So your question was good, and it is good. When you get a Kongan answer, what do you get? Another Kongan question. And it's correct that way, because your intuition has to be kept training. It's very good that way. But you don't get this super don't know experience by solving the Kongan. By using the Huadu, you attain this don't know. By using that to solve a Kongan, it gets put into function. However, there's another kind of mind which I want to you know, spell out here. Sometimes we become really desperate because our practice doesn't seem to work. And then you realize that I really don't know this answer. That's small don't know. It's the desperation, frustration, incapable type of don't know. Now, that I don't, it's an I, I don't know. That has to appear too, because it brings you to your limits. It brings you to what you are incapable of, but it's in you. So then many people give up. They give up their practice, they, they give up their effort, they uh, say bad things about uh, the whole practice and the teachers and other you know, stupid fools who believe it and teach it and all this kind of stuff. And if they follow this kind of thinking, then they are really lost. However, if they really see this kind of reaction as a monk song, as an illusion, then this desperation empties everything out. So then they really come back to deep don't know. I really can't do anything. Can't think of it anymore. Can't feel anything about it anymore. It, it's, this whole ball of your ego is just discarded. 
And there's one moment and everything's empty, everything's gone. Even your frustration is gone because you're frustrated by your own frustration. And then there's a breakthrough. So Kobung Sini was practicing uh, uh, one summer. Uh, he was practicing really hard and uh, uh, he just had this big wadu before him. And uh, he heard the sound of a cicada and that was the last thing that broke through this barrier. And he says, that's it. And he had this fan, he broke it on the rock and went back to the Zen room. No one can really describe it. But you have to have this great question, great faith, great courage to come back to that point when the small don't know becomes big don't know. And then instead of frustrated thinking, you have an experience. But without experiencing the small don't know, the individual frustration, our own incapabilities, you can't get there. You have to get through your own desert so that you would get to the fountain. Okay? Yes, yes. thank you. But uh, can you give a personal comment today to me? I there are so many. many. Look at that. But I don't feel that a good, great Gongan for me. You know, you don't have to. See, personal Kongans are not personal. That means everybody gets the Kongan in our teaching system in a way that you come for an interview and then you start your Zen practice with the Sun Moon Tap, with the Dharma Combat. And we have a collection of 365 Kongans, most of which are you know, tributes to Christian, Taoist and other you know, memories. And uh, more than half of them is something we use or they're just enlightenment poems by Zen masters. So the operational congas are not more than 150 in that sense. And even out of that, you get a sequence. So um, don't wish for a personal conga. And you will get a conga that you will connect to anyway. So there is no kind of private conga teaching in that sense. But you will find your match. You will find your challenge. But it's kind of a standard start because everybody starts in the same way. And the way we continue is really dependent on your answers, where your answers you know, lead you. So it's particular enough, it's tailor-made enough, but there is no personal kongan, it's very expensive, there is no personal kongan to be given either privately or personally, or publicly, you know? It would be misleading that you, as an individual, have one kongan which is just yours, just and only yours. We are not that special. All right? So it would be misleading. We don't do that. But everybody has a means of practicing. It can be a huadu, it can be a yombul, it can be just perceiving sound. And that is the teacher's job to sit down with you and actually work out the practice method. Now that's not a kongan. The practice method is something that the teacher and you agree upon so that you could successfully progress and not be tied and bound by the insufficiency of the methods but experience your own limitations with the combined questions. It's a very different experience. All right, Iriel has it too? Okay, very good. More questions? I've um, been practicing Gongan um, Zen song for a while, but I feel like I'm kind of stuck um, in, the, you know, in the path of to certain purpose. So what is really, uh, what is the real purpose of the uh, Gongan Sun or Hatu Sun? Of course, that you wake up. That's the purpose. So just to stay in the, um, like, uh, emptiness, just no. in a clear mind? Or, uh, you need a teacher. Purpose? You need a teacher. That's why, that's why I say, if you uh, practice with Kongans, you need Dharma combat, and that implies a teacher. So you go to Hwagyasa, Musangsa, or Hungary, Wunkwangsa, or some other place in Korea where they have Kongan practice, Open up and practice with a teacher. The worst kind of thing, and I'm not judging your practice, I'm just saying in general, the worst kind of konga practice is kind of the closeted konga practice where you have ideas about the kongas and there is no human being that can reflect to you, that can actually help you. Because then you have a lot of things coming and going in your consciousness and the kongas actually make it worse. Because you can't solve it. You can't be sure. And uh, then uh, the Zen practice can feel really like a cognitive prison or an emotional pressure or something. Of course you're stuck. How would you not be? This kind of being stuck is correct. 
because you can go individually to a certain extent and after that you can't and you don't even know where you got you don't know how far and to which direction you went you need a teacher to check that out and practice together with other people and that helps so thank you for coming so far thank you for coming to this you know talk and opening this question up and I advise kindly that you practice with a teacher get more teaching and enter the students community all right thank you I know today's Dharma talk is not an easy one but what you should understand is that this is something that you cannot fully understand what you can intuitively perceive and attain and later on use so I wish that all of us in this room would continue practicing the Buddha's path which has been renewed and refreshed so many times by countless people not just patriarchs and uh, sunims but many many of those lay Buddhists who would go unnoticed but without the work of these people without your work, without your effort and practice and the manifestation of the Noble Eightfold Path our tradition would not survive many people ask why did I come to the Korean tradition and uh, it's very clear that since Sum San Sunim was Korean monk I came to follow him to this tradition but I always hasten to add that Sum San Sunim did not create the Korean tradition itself he was born into it if this tradition had not been in, ex in existence for the last 16, 1700 years he would have had to be born in another place in another society in another culture so we are all part of this and one lifetime he is the Zen master another lifetime you are the Zen master remember that we are part of the Buddha's realm the Buddha's society and I wish this could be so lifetime after lifetime so I appreciate uh, your kind and precious attention your invitation and I hope to serve you with more teaching in the future thank you so much Yerobo and Denai Kumar